If you're watching this video, chances are you're a gamer, and as a gamer, you strive to go the extra mile and give 110%. Not within the realms of socializing, exercise, or hygiene, but instead when it comes to the kind of challenges that video games throw at you. Whether that's striving to win video game tournaments, or aiming to beat a speedrunning world record, or even just playing a game on the highest difficulty, gamers love a challenge. But sometimes it's nice to just take it easy, you know? Not everything has to be a brutal competition or an ultimate test of skill. Playing games is, above all else, meant to be fun, and while challenging yourself can be fun, it's not the only way to enjoy yourself. Some people want to put their abilities to the test in a difficult game like Cuphead. Others battle it out online in games like Call of Duty to determine which player truly is the most racist. Or most homophobic, if that's more your style. But then there are people who, rather than smashing controllers out of rage or listening to 12-year-olds scream and pretend to be part of the Hitler Youth, just want to play something chill. Something like Spyro the Dragon. Spyro the Dragon is a game I played as a kid and I always found it relaxing. It wasn't a stressful game, it wasn't a challenging game, it was a game that was calming. It was a game I played with the intention of just vibing. And for that reason I really enjoyed it. But I've never stopped to consider if the game is actually good. All the memories I have of playing Spyro the Dragon are just a blur of hanging out in the living room on hot summer days, booting up the PlayStation and just chilling out. I have very few memories of the game itself, so I wanted to revisit this game and determine whether I actually think it's good or not, because I get so caught up in its relaxing nature that I never look at it in a remotely critical way. It's like I'm seduced into ignoring the flaws and thinking it's perfect. But I won't be seduced this time, this time I've got my chastity belt on, and I'm going to find out just how good Spyro the Dragon truly is. So for those who don't know, Spyro the Dragon is a 3D platformer in a similar vein to Super Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie, in the sense that you explore a variety of open levels in search of collectibles that are scattered throughout. In Spyro the Dragon, you play as Spyro the Dragon, who sets off on an adventure to free his dragon brethren from their crystalline prisons, recover the stolen dragon treasure, and defeat the evil Nasty Nork. The plot of the game is pretty much exactly that. Nasty Nork throws a tantrum because the dragons call him names, so he attempts genocide and steals all the dragon's treasure. I think that's a reasonable reaction, we've all had days like that. You know how sometimes you get bullied, so you kill all people and take their money? But yeah, that's literally the entire plot. I made pretty much the same observation in my Crash Bandicoot video, so I'll use the same analogy. The plot of Spyro the Dragon is a nothing sandwich. There's a beginning, and then absolutely nothing happens until the very end where Spyro defeats Nasty. It's kind of a shame, because you go through all these levels freeing these dragons, but it has no impact on the story whatsoever. You'd think the dragons would lend a hand or something, but no. I get that the plot of this game is very simple and doesn't really need to be fleshed out, but I don't know. It just feels shallow and kind of lame. But we're not here for that. This is a video game, so let's talk about what the gameplay actually is. Like I said, Spyro the Dragon is a 3D platformer. It is also a collectathon, meaning the whole point of the game is to explore levels looking for collectibles. In Spyro, it's all about running around collecting gems and freeing dragons, as well as chasing down thieves to recover dragon eggs. When you say it out loud like that, it does sound pretty boring, but honestly, it's the best part of the whole game. There's something so calming and satisfying about exploring those vibrant levels and collecting all of the gems, some of which are pretty well hidden. It's just a really enjoyable process, and I'm not saying that for the sake of it, it's actually true. Because one thing I noticed while playing this game, and I'm sure other people notice it as well, is that when playing Spyro the Dragon, you will go for 100% completion no matter what. It doesn't matter if your initial plan is to just get through all the levels and beat the game quickly, you will always change your mind and go for 100% completion. You just can't help but go for it. And I think that stands as a true testament to how fun and almost addicting collecting everything is. It gets you every time without fail. Turns out my chastity belt was for nothing. What I think elevates the gameplay further is Spyro's abilities in tandem with the level design. Spyro actually has some pretty unique abilities as far as platformer characters go. Most of them have a jump, sometimes a double jump, a standard attack and maybe some sort of stomp or slam attack. That's the type of thing you expect. Spyro is different, in a good way. He has a regular jump, which you'd expect, but rather than having a double jump, Spyro can glide, which allows him to soar over long distances. And the ability to glide is such an important part of the gameplay. Being able to glide opens up the possibilities for level structure and exploration tremendously. It allows the structure of the levels to be more elaborate and use altitude as an extra layer, since there will be areas far off in the distance that you need to be at a certain height to glide to. 
There will also be areas hidden around cliffs that you need to glide to, like in Dry Canyon and Terrace Village. It makes the levels far more interesting to explore, because rather than just having things hidden around corners, these levels also have an element of verticality that you need to keep in mind if you want to find everything. Out of the collectathons I've played, none of them have levels as cleverly designed as the levels in Spyro the Dragon, and it really is mainly down to gliding. I know it seems like such a small and insignificant thing, but Spyro being able to glide is intrinsic to what makes the game so fun. Just imagine if Spyro wasn't able to glide. Imagine if he just had a double jump. There's no way they would have been able to make levels as interesting to explore. Replacing Spyro's glide with a double jump would be like replacing a car with a shopping cart. Less useful, less versatile, and less cool. The glide is where it's at. But Spyro's abilities extend beyond just gliding. He has several other moves in his arsenal. He has a charge attack, a flame breath attack, and a strafe move. The strafe is pretty much useless, so I don't really have much to say about it. It's probably good as a last minute dodging maneuver, but you're never going to be in a situation where you're overwhelmed with enemy attacks, so it'll almost never come in handy. The Charge Attack and Flame Breath, on the other hand, are incredibly useful and both serve multiple purposes. The Charge Attack is not only an attack that can be used to destroy certain chests and defeat small and armoured enemies, but it's also a faster way of moving around than Spyro's standard run. It can also be used on supercharged ramps to build up ridiculous speed to destroy things that would otherwise be indestructible, and also reach new areas that would otherwise be unreachable. You need only look at the level treetops to see just how far the charge attack and supercharge can be taken to make an intricate, well-designed and fun level. Similarly, the flame breath is also pretty versatile. It can be used to destroy chests that can't be destroyed by the charge attack, it can light fireworks and also defeat large and unarmoured enemies. It can even be made stronger through the power of love to destroy metal objects as well. The level Haunted Towers is a great example of how much you can get out of the flame breath. These two attacks add a whole extra layer to collecting items and traversing levels. And in combination with the glide, they make exploring the various levels a constantly fresh and dynamic experience. Spyro is pretty much the Swiss army knife of platformer characters. So the overall gameplay experience is phenomenal. The cleverly designed levels work brilliantly with Spyro's versatile moveset, and allow for much more involved exploration and, more generally, more interesting gameplay. On top of that, going through the motions of collecting everything is just satisfying. Mainly the gems. Sure, freeing dragons is part of it, but they're obvious and not hard to find. You also have dragon eggs, which can be slightly irritating since you have to chase the thieves down, but they're not really as important. I mean, they stopped appearing altogether after the third world, so even the developers must have gotten sick of them. But the gems are definitely the most satisfying collectible. Going around and picking up gems is just so relaxing, and I honestly believe it's the main appeal of the game. The only downside to the standard gameplay is that there's pretty much no challenge whatsoever. Spyro the Dragon is an extremely easy game. This is probably down to the fact that the enemies pose no threat at all, and also the hit point system in which Spyro can take three hits before he dies, but those hits can be replenished extremely easily by getting sparks to eat butterflies. The game being this easy is kind of a double-edged sword. On one hand, the lack of difficulty plays into the game being so relaxing. You won't get stressed out by a difficult part of the game because there is no difficult part of the game. But on the other hand, if you're not in it for the relaxation, but instead you're in for some action, then Spyro the Dragon will probably disappoint you because action takes a back seat. The most exciting thing you'll ever do in this game is defeat enemies, and even that's not that exciting. There are boss fights in this game, but they're really fucking bad. They rarely even try to hit you. They spend most of the time running away from you. Even the final boss against Nasty is him just avoiding Spyro at all costs. The bosses aren't even that cool or memorable as characters. It's really pathetic and disappointing. You'd hope those boss fights would be the ideal place to introduce some challenge, but no, they're pushovers just like every other enemy in this game. I suppose it really depends on what you're looking for. Where other platformers are like struggling to swim through cold whitewater rapids, Spyro the Dragon is like taking a nice hot bath. If you want a chill experience, Spyro's gameplay is fantastic, but if you want to test your mettle and rise to an impossible challenge, Spyro's gameplay is going to be very underwhelming and boring. There's also the fact that the levels quickly become empty as you're collecting everything, and there's never a reason to return to a level. You can't even replay it for fun because there'd be nothing to collect anymore. That kind of sucks too. There are flight levels, which shakes up the gameplay a bit. In flight levels you need to collect or destroy four sets of eight items before time runs out. There's a bit of action here, you're on a time limit, and you can even repeat the flight levels to set a new personal best, so there's an element of competition in there as well. I personally don't enjoy the flight levels as much, I just don't find them fun, but I can definitely see the appeal. But overall, whether you enjoy the gameplay or not is really down to what you want to get out of the game. If you want a chill time picking up collectibles, 
then Spire the Dragon is brilliant. If you want a challenging time with plenty of action, Spire the Dragon will probably be a bit lacking, but I think objectively, the gameplay is pretty solid. That's not all the game has to offer though. Spire the Dragon has an amazing atmosphere. The environments and music are incredible. The locations you visit are always colourful and lively, even when they're set at night or in darkness. None of them are ugly, except for Misty Bog, which is this horrible combination of green and pink. And whoever thought of that should have been shot on sight, but it's been decades, so I'll let it go. The music feels magical and perfectly matches those settings, and like the gameplay, they're always pretty chill. I do have one complaint though. Even though all the environments besides Misty Bog look great, they are a bit repetitive with their themes. There are a lot of similar environments, lots of castle exteriors and interiors, lots of grassy plains, it's all very... samey. Especially when you put the Magic Crafters and Dreamweavers worlds next to each other, you can hardly tell the difference. Even in the Artisan's world, look at Town Square, and then look at Toasty's level. You can only tell they're different levels because I told you. The only worlds that don't suffer from this are the Peacekeepers and Beast Makers, since they have quite a bit of variation from level to level. In Peacekeepers you have an expansive canyon, a town in the desert, and an icy cave. In Beast Makers you have a village, a swamp, and treetops. There's a lot of variation there. The other worlds are just... castles. When I replayed the game for this video, I did find myself having a lot of deja vu moments. Every time I'd enter a castle themed level I'd think to myself, Haven't I been here before? I swear I've seen this exact empty castle room multiple times already. And you know, as great as those castles are, the novelty sort of wears off, and you occasionally find yourself wishing you could just look at... something else. But that brings me to the conclusion. How good is Spire the Dragon? I would say from an objective standpoint that Spire the Dragon is a very solid game. The gameplay is solid and satisfying, Spire has a great moveset and controls really well, the game looks and sounds fantastic despite being slightly repetitive with the settings, the game just has too many good things going for it for it not to be a good game. But whether a particular individual will enjoy it is purely down to what the individual wants out of a platformer. If you want a difficult platformer that will challenge your depth perception, your precision, your patience, and your controller's durability, Spyro the Dragon might not be the game for you. But if you're just looking for a chill time, you want to relax, explore, pick up some juicy collectibles, Spyro the Dragon is the perfect game for you. But personal preferences aside, I think it's pretty hard to deny that Spyro the Dragon is a great game and definitely worth a shot no matter who you are.